What a great uh, lead off to what we're talking about uh, right now. And I want to encourage you, just reach in your Connect folder, grab your notes. We're in a series, we're calling the series, uh, Bless This Mess. Say that out loud with me, Bless This Mess. And so I find right now, uh, we are in a unique place uh, in our culture and in our society. And this is really what this series is all about. It's this idea of how the church is the church in a broken world. How many of you by the showing of your hands would say there just seems like a lot of stuff in our world right now that's not working right, that's broken? How many of you would acknowledge I've got some stuff inside of me that's broken and not working right? Great. Some of you should just stand up right now. I mean, I know who you are. And so we're like, we're thinking about this and we're having, I think, an open conversation about it. And earlier this year, I, I was just you know, like many of us looking at the news and watching these things. And I, said, I just started to say in my heart, you know, Lord, what is the response of the church to this? Because there's just some stuff. And I, I am not one of those people that feels like this is the most challenging time ever. And I, I run in maybe like you do to these conversations and people go, this is like the most challenging time in history. I want to go, have you ever read history? I mean, there's some challenging times in history, but I will say this, it might be, a, it is a challenging time for us. And, and what God is really wanting the church to do is to navigate troubled waters in a way that, make a, that makes a difference. And, and, and part of the reason I really felt deeply in my heart that I wanted to begin, uh, have a series and invite a conversation in the room about this is in some ways, and, and again, this is going to be challenging, a little bit of a challenging talk today, and it's going to be also a talk where we're, we're going to just lay some groundwork around some things that I want us to get a better handle on. One of the things I, I think about sometimes is I feel like the church is retreating. We're stepping back. And, uh, you know, I just notice where there's all this stuff going on in the world and the church is just kind of being minimalized because we're not often understood right now in our culture. Sometimes what is said about the church, the capital C church and our culture, I don't know about you, I'll hear that sometimes and go, that doesn't reflect me at all. And yet God is inviting us to make a difference. He's inviting us to step into that. So I began to think about, okay, where do I see this in scripture? Where do I see this kind of teaching, this kind of idea going on? What was really happening with some of the early disciples, some of the early followers of Christ? What about reaching back into the Old Testament? Where do I see other followers of God that embraced troubled times and made a difference? And that's where this series is coming from. Now, if you're with us, uh, last week we began... And we started the series, and this is a theme verse uh, that's going to uh, appear every weekend, both campuses in the series. This is Paul's words in Ephesians chapter 5, verse 15 and 16. And this is sort of the framework around the series. Let's just read this out loud together and get our minds thinking about it. going to read out loud. T t ready and go. Be very careful then how you live, not as unwise, but as wise, making the most of every opportunity for the days are evil. Now, when I don't know about you, but when I read that, I go, man, did Paul like write that last month? Because I think that's kind of a challenging word. And, and, and as is often true of Scripture, Scripture endures. And it speaks against culture and around culture and about culture every time. It's constantly being renewed because God's Holy Spirit is in His Word. So this is important for us. And so I, I, I don't know if you remember or not or know, but I want to share it with you. When Paul was writing uh, these words, he was writing to a very young set of followers of Jesus in the Ephesus region. We'd think of it as modern day Turkey, like right now, just in Asia Minor, sometimes referred to as Asia Minor, just off the Aegean Sea. Scholars think Paul had made several missionary journeys through this region. In fact, three missionary journeys. And on the third missionary journey, he was uh, particularly in this area, he spent, scholars think, maybe two years raising up some churches, small little bands of people, not like this, that would just be followers of, of Christ. He was teaching them uh, th the way of Christ, and then he left. And scholars think he left after two years, and then it was about 10 years later, he got arrested and was uh, in chains in Rome, and he wrote the letter uh, which has the words you and I just read. 
So he sent this letter by courier back to these Ephesian churches. And this is what would happen, uh, scholars believe. He, the, the, the courier would go to these different regions, go to these little churches, stand up sort of uh, with these people, and he would read this letter to them. And they would, they would all think about it, they would talk about it, and the courier would go to another church, and that's, that's how it went down. Now, here's what's interesting. It's always a good safe bet to say whenever Paul's writing, he was in prison, because Paul was always in prison. Okay, But here's what we want to know about that, and what I want you to know. He was in prison for a very particular reason. He was in prison because he, he took a, a Gentile convert to the temple. Okay, Interesting, right? How many of you all have a friend, or maybe you even thought about this uh, about yourself one time, maybe before you started attending church, maybe Community of Hope, and somebody invited you to church, you ever heard this phrase, man, if I showed up at church, the walls would fall down, <laughs> right? You got friends? So apparently there were people back then in biblical times that thought that about you and me, because most of us in this room are Gentiles. And so, so Paul takes a Gentile convert to the temple, next thing you know, he's in prison. As a result of it. And as a result of that, here's what Paul was doing. Paul was opening the door for Gentiles to find faith and hope in Jesus Christ. Someone say amen, because that's all of us. And in fact, one of my favorite verses of scripture, I think, it's, we, I think we have it, it's in Roman, or uh, yeah, it's in Acts, excuse me, 15, 19, it says this, here's Paul. He said, it's in my judgment, therefore, that we should not make it difficult for the Gentiles who are turning to God. Yay, Paul, that's us. And so, so Paul, Paul begins to crack the door open. So whenever I think about this conversation, this is what I think about. This is when we got an invitation to the party. This is us. We get to show up. And so Paul is writing this to a very particular context, to a very particular situation, and he's inviting people in. And he's inviting people in. And I often find that whenever we read the Bible, this is oftentimes what we think. This is, and you probably do this. You don't have to say you do it, but I know you do it. We'll read the Bible and we think, this is a super religious person writing to other super religious people. So that's not me. So I tune out. And here's what I want, I want you to know. This is Paul, and we might go, okay, super religious person, writing not to seasoned veterans. He's writing to rookies. Any rookies in the room? And he's, and he's, he's saying these words. Put, put them on the screen again. Ephesians, Ephesians 5, 15, and 16. Now, now knowing that he's not writing to seasoned vets, that he's writing to rookies, let's read it again because we're all rookies probably, right? Let's read it. Ready? Go. Be very careful then how you live, not as unwise, but as wise making the most of every opportunity because the days are evil. He's writing to you and me. Be very careful then how you live. Study the culture around you. Notice that. Don't just get carried away and caught up in it. Take a moment to step back and look at what's going on and go, I don't know if I really want to be a part of that in that way. Don't be unwise, be wise. Make the most of every opportunity. For the days are evil. And I don't know about you, but this is what I love about this. He, he, he combines in that sentence, making the most of every opportunity, but the days are evil. You notice there, Paul's not fatalistic. Paul is not resigned. But what he is, he's saying, there's troubling times out there. There's stuff out there that's challenging. Don't give up. Don't refuse to have hope. Step in. And when you step in, it's difficult. In fact, sometimes it's awkward. When you go to make the most of an opportunity, it can be awkward. Many of you know, I think, I think Billy shared last week, we may have a picture of this. Trevor and I uh, were in Lakeland last week. Let me just see if the guys got this. And uh, it was Trevor's ordination. There he is. Look at that. Isn't that cool? So that's, 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 that uh, he gets to choose two elders to lay hands on him. That's called the elder stole. And he had to choose me because I'm his boss. <laughs> <laughs> and the other guy over there uh, is uh, Pastor David was his childhood pastor growing up. Isn't that awesome? 
So we all laid hands on him and we told him afterwards, I told him, I said, okay, so now it's official. Try not to screw this up, okay? <laughs> so like I left this deal and we were in Lakeland and I had to drive back to preach. I mean, I was gonna come flying in pretty hot, stick the landing and come in here and preach on Saturday night. And we were over, I was over there in Lakeland. How many was, how many of y'all have ever been to Lakeland? Okay, Lakeland is as hot as the surface of the sun. I mean, I was there, I think it was 900 degrees. I don't know. It was, it was really hot. And, and I had to park to be a part of this. It was so well attended. There were like a million people there. So when I parked my truck, I parked like, a mile away and I am walking sweats dripping off of me by by the time I got there I'm not even sure I I love Trevor any longer I mean it was <laughs> it was awkward and so we went through we went through this service the service like two hours and I and then I said Trevor I'm gonna have time to take a quick picture like this one and I said I gotta get back I mean someone's got to work right I like we have a service Saturday night so I am walking back to my car the mile back to get to the car. And I'm thinking, you know what? I can double up. This is where it started to go wrong. I thought I could double up the time on this. I should change real quick in the parking lot. And then I don't have to worry about that. And it's hot. And, and, and I'm so far parked away. I'm tucked in behind this building. No one will ever know. <laughs> Do you see how this is about to break bad? So I am walking over, I'm walking across the campus, I'm taking this robe off and taking the stole off and I, I, I untucked my shirt, I took my tie off and then I did all that work and then I got to the truck. There is nobody around me. And I thought, I can do this. <laughs> and I mean, as the Lord is my witness, I mean, I, I changed my shirt, I took, I took my shoes off and there's that awkward moment, I'm just gonna name it, the pants got to go if I'm going to make this change. And so down go the pants. And as the Lord is my witness, the minute the pants go down, here comes a guy walking around the side of the building with 60 people on a tour of the college. <laughs> I'm not even making this up. And I mean, I turn around. Here's a guy with a flag. He goes... Here's the historical building on the left, creepy guy on the right in his underwear. <laughs> and this guy, like, this guy's walking by me and he's doing this number. He's just going, man, what on earth? And he said, uh, so he goes, so you're at the ordination service. I said, yeah, I was. He goes, great. I said, yeah, my name's Pastor Trevor Johnson. I just got ordained. <laughs> I thought they'll never know who I am. When God calls us to make a difference, listen to this, it's going to feel awkward. When you want to make the best of every opportunity, I think in a culture like today, for us to live our faith in a winsome, beautiful way, sometimes it's just, it can be misunderstood. It can feel a little weird. Uh, Peter was writing one time, and Peter wrote these wonderful words. He said, but in your hearts, he's writing to rookies. Keep that in play. He's writing to rookies and he says, but in your hearts, revere Christ as Lord. Be prepared to give an answer for everyone who asks you to give the reason for the hope that you have. But do it with gentleness and do it with respect. When the body of Christ begins to address the mess of the world around us, I can tell you what it should look like. I can tell you what it should smell like. I could tell you what it reminds people of every time. It should look and smell like hope every single time. And when, and, and when Paul was writing this, when Peter was writing this, he, they were writing to rookies. And the rookies, watch this, they took it. They owned it. They lived it. And that's why you and I are here. If they didn't do it that way, this wouldn't be happening. We would have all said, 
But see, behind that, they were doing that, and that's the kind of fabric, that's the kind of spirit, that's sort of the atmosphere, that's the recipe, and that's why I believe Jesus would choose the most crazy way to get his work done in the world through the church. And he said, I'll build my church. Remember what he said about it? And the gates of hell will not prevail against it. Why? Because the church goes to address the mess, and every time it does, it smells like hope. Looks like hope. Feels like hope. And what I want to remind everybody in this room is that we have a lot of people in our culture today, they don't feel hope. They can't find it. We all know right now, right? We're, we're all just talking about this epidemic rise of suicide in our culture. What's your diagnosis for that? I can tell you mine. People don't feel hope. And we got it. We got to share it. A while back, I was thinking about this early in the series, or uh, early in my study for this. And I thought about a guy who came to my mind that I think really embodies what I want us to say. It's an Old Testament character. One of my favorite Old Testament characters, by the way. And every time he, uh, people ever talk about, you know, like, who are the Hall of Fame people in the Bible? And they go from Old to New Testament. This guy's name always appears in that list. His name was Nehemiah. And Nehemiah was part of the exiled people who were carried off into captivity and into exile by the Babylonian army. Scholars think it happened like around 586 B.C. And they were carted off and carried off, and he was placed as a cupbearer to King Artaxerxes, which is Xerxes' son, to malicious, difficult people in, in history. And a cupbearer in many ways was almost like a secret service. He, he was placed in the secret service of a king in a nation that wasn't his nation. Imagine, just get your mind and heart around that. And uh, he has a conversation one day, and I'm just going to read you two verses of it that um, changed history. And uh, in this book, I find five movements that I want to challenge you with this morning. All of the movements are just shadowed ever so briefly in the first chapter. So if you know anything about biblical history, Nehemiah chapter 1 is sort of a table of contents of what's about to happen in all of Nehemiah. You get the fuller story. I commend you to read it. It's challenging. But in Nehemiah chapter 1, verse 1, this is, this is how it begins. And I want to point out five things will be done on this Father's Day. Uh, it begins like this. It says in Nehemiah 1, 1, this is the words of Nehemiah, the son of Hakaliah, in the month of Kislev, in the 20th year, while I was in the citadel of Susa. Scholars think the citadel of Susa was the summer residence to King Artaxerxes. So now he's in the summer residence of this king. And uh, Hanani, he says, one of my brothers came from Judah, which is where they were exiled from, with some other men. Watch this. And I questioned them about the Jewish remnant that had survived the exile, and I questioned them about Jerusalem. So this, th these, guys, these guys come through, uh, probably under some sort of an assignment, and Nehemiah seizes on the opportunity to ask, watch this, about his homeland. Let's imagine that. What's happening there? I mean, I'm cut off from my people. I don't know anything. What, what, what can you tell me? And, and all this story, this incredibly powerful story, begins just with Nehemiah asking the simple question. So what about Judah? What about Jerusalem? What about my people? And, and, and they tell him the sad story that it's in disrepair and all of this, and, 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 sh and go to the end of the story, Nehemiah solicits this king that he's working for. He finds favor. He goes back and he restores the walls, the broken Jerusalem, and he defends the name and the sacred honor of God, the God of Israel in that moment. Just so powerful. But there are five things 
that I notice he does. That if you and I are ever going to really fully and completely address the mess in our world, address the mess in our lives, I find that it's always going to look like one of these five things. And so honestly, you could take these five things, you could put them in all these different contexts. Here's what happens. They stand up. They endure. I want to give them to you. The first one is this. Nehemiah becomes aware of what's going on around him. Half the struggle, I think, about the church really being the church is that we just become aware. Wouldn't you agree? We just live with a greater sense of awareness. Like, Lord, you're, you're at work in the world. God, where do you want to use us? I mean, what, what do you want to say in this moment? I, I went the other day after I told you, I, I come back, I'd sweat through my suit and did all that ordination stuff. And I come back and I had a wedding yesterday. It's been a busy week. And I thought, I got to get my suit to the cleaners. And I, I, I go over in to take it to the cleaners. I've been going to this cleaners for 20 years. I mean, all these people know me. And I go, in, I go in there and I walk in and there's this guy I've never seen before and he's standing off in the corner and, and I just felt a little bit of a weird vibe. You ever walk into a place and feel like, that feels a little weird in here. And I, I walk in, I walk up to the ladies that are always ser- serve me there. They're just so nice and so kind. Adam's cleaner's there. And I, and I, I, I give my stuff. The whole time I'm talking to the ladies, I feel this guy on the side of me, over on the side, and I feel like he is just beaming his like just eyes through my face. And so I, I, I looked over to him and I said, hey, I, how are you? He looked at me stone cold, never responded. I went, man, wow. I tried to act like I ignored that or wasn't uh, you know, in tune with that, but I started to think, I mean, all of a sudden I started to think, I wonder if everything's going, if everything's okay in here. And I'm wondering if my friends, I wonder if they're safe. And so I, I, I looked over again and I said, how are you doing? How are you doing this morning? Nothing. And there was some distance, and, I, and so what I did, I stepped back, and I, I just, I, I moved toward him. And I said, how, I said, how are you? And when I did that, he, he, he said, I'm fine, how are you? Whoa. And I started to think, man, I need to navigate, like, is everything okay? And right in that time, the owner comes in, and she walks up, and she introduced me. She said, I want to introduce you to this a young man, she said, um, he was sleeping last night behind the store, and he doesn't have a home. And uh, Pastor Dale, we're just we're trying to help him out. So like the whole mood sort of changed. And so I, you know, I, I, I offered some assistance, offered some help, but I couldn't get that out of my mind all day long. Because she said as I'm walking out the door, he's going to be here all day. And I thought, hmm. And so I went and made a hospital visit uh, mid-afternoon, and then I thought, I'm just going to go back over there, okay? So I go back over there, and this time she's not there, he's not there, and just the other, the other associates at work there are, are there, and I started to ask some questions, and they started to say, yeah, this was, it was kind of, it was a little scary, and all of that, and they said, I appreciated, you know, appreciated that you were there. It was just this idea of being aware and, and so um, while I'm talking to them, um, the owner calls and I talk to the owner on the phone and the owner says, hey, have the girls give you my cell number and if anything else, like we can stay in touch with them, that'd be great. So I, I hung up the phone, gave it back to one of the workers and I said, hey, Anna wants you to give me her cell number. And the girl looks at me, she goes, I ain't giving you no cell number. <laughs> and I thought, I've, I've been here 20 years, give me the cell number, <laughs> you know? And so while I'm talking to her, the phone rings and it's Anna going, give him the number. And I can hear her going, yeah, I wasn't going to, I wasn't going to give that number. I'm not, he's not getting your number. And I, I'm like, then she gives me the number, <laughs> whatever. And it was just this idea of becoming aware. A lot of the ways God gets the work done in the world is you and I become aware. Then notice this, write this down real quickly. Nehemiah, secondly, he invites God in. Do you notice that? What happens there in verse four? When I heard these things about the wall, when I heard these things about Jerusalem, I sat down, I wept for some days, I mourned, I fasted, I prayed. And he invited God in. And, and here's what I want to remind everybody. That is not our first muscle memory for many of us who are getting minds and hearts around serving God and being open to the spirit of God in our lives. We tend to retreat to other things. 
you have to really develop some muscle memory around that. Can I tell you one of the ways I'll do it? Oftentimes in my morning prayers, I'll say, Lord, you are going to be at work in and around me all day long. If you would like for me to participate, point it out. Let me just say that again. You're going to be at work, Lord, in and around me all day long. If you'd like me to participate, point it out. That's what Nehemiah did. He just invited God into it. Most of us, here's what we do right here. We retreat. We just go, you know, I, I don't know, not, not my problem. Which brings me to the third point. If you're taking notes, write it down. Then not only did he invite God in, he owned his part. Do you notice? I, I don't know about you. I'm challenged. He said, Lord, I, I, I just, I repent of all the things that Jerusalem has done. And I repent I t- what I did too. See, sometimes it's not that we're directly involved. Watch this. It's that we're indirectly involved. It's just that we don't, we just live blind. And I think right now, God is calling his people in this culture right now, this crazy culture right now, let's live less blind to what is going on around us. And you're going to hear this a lot from me. Right now in our culture, we are making red and blue issues what are not red and blue issues. They're follower of Christ issues. And we need to reframe the conversation and go, this is not blue. This is not red. It's a follower of Christ issue. And we invite God in. And we own our part. I mean, it would have been easy for me to to deal with this uh, young man who, I don't know his story. I don't know his situation. I just know he doesn't have a home. I know he didn't have food. He didn't have shoes. It'd be easy for me, and it'd be easy for you to go, not my problem. And I think right there, when we do that, we become part of the problem right there. Notice these two other things real quickly. He partnered with God in the work. Verse 11. Let your ear be attentive to the prayer of your servant and to the prayer of your servants who delight in revering your name. I'm just taken with the idea of servants. Servant does the work of the master. We don't, we don't talk about that in our culture. It sounds weird. But we are to be servants of the king. God's got some work he wants to do through us. I was reading a while back, I want to say this kind of quickly, but I want, I want to read it. I was reading that recently someone said the worst kind of injustice toward other human beings is not hostility it's indifference hostility is recognized and by the way uh, it's recognized because we can usually see it coming and another way hostility is a kind of emotion that's different is you almost need a predisposition toward it because most of us he writes are not hostile people but indifference he says is different it often leaves people victim, law, uh, victims lost in a sea of ambiguity trying to figure out and weigh in whether we care or not. And the other reason it's so horrible, it violates the way you and I have been created in the image of God of whom Scripture reminds us that the God we serve is filled with compassion, full of mercy. And then he says this, boom, mic drop. He goes, Jesus was never indifferent, ever. You know some of my prayers right now? Lord, I just, I don't want to be indifferent. I just don't. I don't, want, I don't want to be a part of a church that retreats. I want to be a part of a church that steps in. And then lastly, just write, take a notice real quickly. Nehemiah trusted in the promises of God. Wasn't fatalistic, wasn't without hope. So I thought I would do something just as a way to close. And then, and then also we're going to, we have a team that just left for Costa Rica. We're going to pray for that team this morning. But before we do that, I, I asked the guys, I said, let's just put all five movements of what Nehemiah did. Became aware, invited God in, owned his part, partnered in the work, trusted in the promise. And here's what I want you to do. I can't manufacture your mess. I can't. You get to self-select your mess. But I want to tell you this. Here's what I want to challenge you to do in this moment. I want you to think about the mess in and around you. 
And I want to ask you to, to think about which one is God calling you to own? Is it just being more self-aware? Is it inviting God in? Is it owning your part? Is it saying, God, use me? Is it trusting in the promise? That's where we don't lose hope. We give a reason for the hope that's within us. I don't know about you. I've read the last pages of the book of the Bible. God wins. He wins, everybody. Everybody relax. God wins, okay? But he's got some work to do in our culture. And he's inviting us. So here's what I want to do. I want to pray for you, and we will often do this. Now, for those of you visiting, you're going to go, oh, no, it's about to get weird. It's not going to get weird. But I do want to ask you to do this. A lot of times I'll ask those when you pray, let's pray with our hands on our laps, facing up, just as a way to say, you know, God, I'm open. I mean, this is a moment. I just even my posture, just want it to be open to what you're doing. Now, Lord, a lot of us, maybe online and, and even right here in this space, we're we are open in this moment to bring before you, oh God, our mess. Would you give us a capacity to land on one of these movements of how you address the mess in our lives and in our world? So whatever it would be, oh Lord, in these five movements, which one is it? Right now, point it out deeply in our heart and then build in our heart right now courage to engage with that movement. Some of us today, it'll be a conversation you have. It'll be a note you write. It'll be something that you scribble down in your planner or on your phone to say, I'm, I'm going to be in tune, better in tune to this. God, you do it. By the power of your grace, let the church rise up and address the mess going on around us. This we pray. And also now in this moment, Jesus, we come together as a body. We remember our, our team that is serving in Costa Rica. Uh, Todd Krajewski leading that team. Just pray capacity and wisdom for him as he leads. And then all of those that are there serving in the name of Jesus in Costa Rica. God, I pray provision and courage and safety and every good thing over them. We thank you, Lord for your wisdom and your truth in our lives. Let us make the most of every opportunity in these evil days. For we pray in Jesus' name and everyone said, amen. God bless you. Go in his mercy and his grace. We'll see you next weekend.